I am pleased today to uh, introduce Stephen Yurchik from Yale University, um, who will speak on the subject of Vasily Polyanov, the Balkan Wars and Landscape Painting in the Russian Periodical Press. And his talk will be followed by a response from Sabisiednik, uh, Lucien Freire of Ryder University. So um, over to you, uh, Stephen. So, you know, I'd just like to first of all extend my thanks once again to the 19B organizing committee. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out especially to Margaret and Sarah because we originally conceived this session, I think, as sort of a panel discussion among several grad students, but uh, I guess because of the pandemic and the holidays, we had a depressed turnout, but they still decided to kind of go ahead and sort of give me an opportunity as a new scholar to make this talk. Um, so, you know, I deeply appreciate that and all of sort of the uncompensated labor and work that goes into this undertaking. Um, so with that said, I'll just go ahead and jump right into the talk. Um, in late January 1878, the painter Vasily Polenov arrived at the country residence of Moscow industrialist and fabled Masseneus Sava Mamontov. The estate at Bramsova is here pictured on the left in an 1880 canvas by Polenov's close colleague, Ilya Repin. In the mid 1880s, Polenov, Repin, and many other famous Russian easel painters joined Mamontov at Abramsova in a revival of the decorative arts, which fused craft concerns with Slavic identity. At what these artists described as the best dacha in the world, they divested themselves of their professional worries. They threw off the burden of everyday cares to freely throw pots, turn chairs, and most famously, erect and decorate a chapel on the abrupts of the grounds. The loose plain air fracture and cheerful tones of Repin's landscape sketch effortlessly recapitulate this sense of untroubled leisure for us today. However, on that cold January morning in 1878, Vasily Polenov allegedly lugged in with him a soldier's kit bag. Polenov arrived at this idyllic country setting, still very much encumbered. He carried a sack of sobering sketches made on his sojourns through Serbia and Bulgaria during the Eastern crisis of 1875 to 1878. The drawings in Polenov's rucksack, such as the two I have excerpted here on the screen at right, were both graphic in the sense of belonging to the graphic arts, as well as graphic in the sense of being visually disturbing. These artworks prompted Mamontov's brother Sivilov to claim that from that day forward, Vasily Dmitrievich never left my eyes. Now this quote incidentally could express two meanings and its ambiguity is emblematic of the objectives of my talk today. The comment could on the one hand communicate concern for Polenov's emotional well-being, that is, Polenov's friends were reluctant to leave him alone by himself, having recently witnessed the traumas of war. On the other hand, it could equally indicate how these serious artworks confirmed Polenov's status as a talented creator, worthy of the continued close attention of the Abramsova circle. In any case, I want to demonstrate how the one could lead to the other, how Polenov's wartime engagements could conceivably contribute to his nomination as a member of this elite and a fet set. I am to show how the Slavic revival in late Imperial Russia and his contributions to a charismatic national landscape aesthetic in particular was congruent with Russia's territorial ambitions abroad. To briefly recap those territorial ambitions, the Eastern crisis to which I refer was a years long geopolitical dispute it began when Russia tacitly supported nationalist rebels in Serbia and Bulgaria, attempting to revolt from the Ottoman Empire. It escalated when Russia looked the other way as the General Mikhail Cherneyev raised and dispatched an all-volunteer army of irregulars to support these breakaway Orthodox Christian partisans. It finally boiled over into full great power warfare in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878. Vasily Polenov was present at every step of the way. I will present today two of those episodes from Polenov's wartime travels abroad, excerpted from a chapter in my dissertation, Realism by Rail, Art and Mobilities in Late Imperial Russia. My overarching goal with this writing project 
has been simply to ask how the once and future members of Russia's Partnership for Traveling Art Exhibitions, known collectively as the Wanderers, in fact themselves wandered. A romanticized version of the history of painters like Ilya Repin or Vasily Polonov at one point maintained that they were swept up in democratic populist politics and brought art to the people. We now recognize that they did not really even travel with the eponymous traveling exhibitions that they helped to organize. Nevertheless, these artists were not homebodies. Polenov, for his part, went twice to Serbia and Bulgaria during the Eastern crisis, joining the partnership promptly after his return in 1878. To wit, Polenov first served as a special artist correspondent for the journal Chela during the Serbo-Turkish War of 1876-1877. Founded in 1875, Chala was a Russian illustrated weekly magazine based on the model of publications like the Illustrated London News or The Graphic. Hired by the journal's arts editor, the renowned St. Petersburg art critic and art historian Adrian Prachov, Polenov submitted numerous sketches to the publication. It reproduced them as wood engravings as part of the recurring series, Album of a Russian Volunteer. One of these engravings here appears on the cover at the screen at left. Polenov then returned to the Balkans a second time for the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878. Polenov had been given an offer he could not refuse to commemorate for the ruling Romanov family Russia's anticipated victory over the Ottoman Empire. The royal household commissioned him to create a series of paintings, which he eventually completed in 1883. One of his attempts towards this project, an unprepossessing canvas of a quaint whitewashed Bulgarian hut, I have placed on the screen at right. My talk will begin by first treating Polenov's early work with Chola. I will explain how the pictures he filed home from the front use the tropes and techniques of pastoral landscape painting to intervene in the discourse about alleged reprisals against Christian non-combatants in the Balkans. I will then secondly look closely at the reception of the bucolic motif of the Balkan cottage as it appears in Polenov's work on the Romanov Commission. I will analyze his homestead's polemical place in the Russian imperial imaginary. And specifically, I'll examine how Polenov engages the style of the picturesque to aspirationally transfer many of the qualities imputed to the households of Serbia and Bulgaria to the outskirts of Moscow instead. I make these overtures to landscape art because history does not really remember Vasily Polenov as a battle painter. Polenov may never have left the site of the abrupts of a circle after showing it his wartime studies, but the sketches themselves have mostly since faded from posterity's view. It is one of the aims of my talk today to begin to bring those unsettling objects from the Eastern crisis back to light and to integrate them with Polenov's more durable identity as a landscapist. Polenov is better known to us for his powerfully sentimental views of Russia such as the 1878 picture Moscow Courtyard now up on the screen. It is my argument that the apocryphal rucksack full of sketches that Polenov plopped on the floorboards of Obramsova was not an aberration or a false start to Polenov's career as a maker of charming rural scenes. Polenov's Balkan engagements did not tear him away from his more mainstream landscape paintings of European Russia. They helped make them possible. This is because Polenov's sketchbooks were not a continuous litany of suffering. Right beside his scenes of dead and dying soldiers, Polenov also repeatedly drew the Balkan cottage, several samples of which are shown here on the left. These are, in their outward form and subject matter, similar to Moscow Courtyard or Ilya Repin's pastoral portrait of Abramsova in spring. Indeed, Repin in particular had something to say about Polenov's persistent preoccupation with landscape art, despite there being a war on. To his great dismay, Repin had been unable to join the various artists sketching on the front lines of the Eastern crisis. Repin's letters to fellow painter Ivan Krepskoy expressed amazement that Polenov had not chosen to make more 
out of his first-hand battlefield experiences. Despite witnessing the Russian army in battle, Repin complained to Kravskoy how Polenov painted instead their huts, their quarters, inside and out. The places where they stood idle, that's all. There's no trace of the war, not a single soldier or gun. He saw none of this. The Russian army is not picturesque, but the Turkish one's another matter. Indeed, true to Repin's letter, many of the canvases Polenov completed on the Balkan theme depict those nondescript way stations, headquarters, and lodgings of the Russian army in Bulgaria. There are, to my knowledge, no scenes of the Russian army in action by Vasily Polenov in oil paints. More to the point is a provocative fact that it is precisely such picturesque huts as Repin decries for which Polenov would later become famous in lieu of his putative battle painting. Many of Polenov's most celebrated works like Moscow Courtyard belong exactly to the genre of pleasing, tumbled down disrepair denoted in the English language by the artistic style of the picturesque. At the very least, these cozy shacks are certainly painterly subjects in the literal or first order definition of Rebin's Russian term, Zhivapisnaya. They are attractive examples of everyday beauty fit for representation in art. My talk today will treat how Vasily Polenov poignantly politicizes these pastoral themes. I will track how the same attractive decrepitude we see in Vasily Polenov's beloved pictures of his Russian homeland is also present in his more obscure scenes from the contested imperial hinterlands of Serbia and Bulgaria. Polenov arrived at the need to create enticing Russian spaces in part through an ongoing competition or paragone with Russia's so-called little brother Slavs, the Serbs and Bulgarians. He had to express how Russia's imperial core was as vibrant and as pleasing as the peripheral tracts of land it sought control over. Now I will add as a caveat that the abbreviated form of my argument today, derived from a much larger chapter, will leave Polenov looking a little jingoistic, a term that first originated at this moment in England in response to Russia's participation in the Balkan crisis. However, I aim to at least lay the groundwork for a reassessment of Russian rustic painting, of which Polenov is a preeminent exponent. If Polenov originates Russian landscape in response to imperialist anxieties about the periphery, he nevertheless remained profoundly attuned to the humanitarian catastrophe touched off by the conflict. His landscape paintings are thus no less critical than the masterpieces of realist genre. Polenov's landscapes remain subtly, incisively attuned to the problems of their day. And this is a feature that ostensibly puts Polenov on par with his interlocutor in this talk so far, the great Ilya Repin. So to get started, the first 1877 issue of the St. Petersburg-based illustrated magazine Chola hit newsstands with its very first installment of a brand new serialized column, the album of a Russian volunteer. This first drawing in the series by Polenov was of a detachment of Serbian horsemen, peaceably watering their mounts at a decrepit fountain. Polenov shears off the top half of the architectural folly, which caps this well. With dark passages of shadow, the artist here gives a suggestion of either ivy or uncleared rubble cloaking its roof. Polenov's crumbling structure casts the conflict back into some ambiguous orientalist antiquity for the journal's readers. He screens beneath this pastoral facade the machinations of great power realpolitik upon which Chola elsewhere reported. The sketch is a good initial example of Ilya Repin's complaint that Polenov was not one to paint guns. On the very same page as Polenov's horseman, an uncredited engraver for Chola foregrounded an antiquated Turkish mortar seized by Bulgarian partisans in battle. The weapon slung across the shoulder of Polenov's Serbian outrider is by contrast, fairly distinguishable as such. It could as easily be a lance or a firearm for all the beholder can determine. The beholder encounters such ambiguity because in this print, as in Repin's quote, it is architecture and not arms that takes center stage. Polenov originally obtained his connection to the journal Chalot 
through the brothers Mstislav and Adrian Prahov. The former Prahov Mstislav was famously the self-proclaimed spiritual leader of Sava Mamontov's circle at Abramsova. The latter Prahov Adrian, in addition to his other hustles as a renowned lecturer and critic, edited the arts desk of this new weekly illustrated magazine, Shalom. Incorporated only months before the outbreak of the Eastern crisis, Shalom was in seeking to get in on the market share that better established weeklies like Semyonaya Illustratia and Niva had monopolized and opposed in Russia for the better part of a decade. Prahov used his position to increase the profile of a new generation of young Russian painters and throw valuable commissions their way. For instance, Prahov gave Polenov's horsemen pride of place on the cover to the bound collection of all 1877's 52 weekly editions pictured here on the left. Prahov additionally raided Polenov's oeuvre for other appositely Orientalist themed artworks he could elsewhere reproduce. Polenov's Odialisk, for example, made the magazine's cover in March 1877 not long after Polenov's Serbian horsemen appeared in that year's first issue. Polenov again appeared beneath the magazine's masthead the next year in January 1878 with his sketch of a Montenegrin. Its pendant picture, Montenegris, had already also attained yet another congenial full page placement back the year before. But Polenov's earliest Serbo-Turkish war materials were apparently plenty enough on their own to excite none other than Ilya Repin himself. Repin wrote Polenov on January 20th, 1877 from his hometown of Chuhiv in Ukraine. It's well done what you drew for Chilla, Repin told Polenov. Even here in the provinces, I see what a role it's playing. It's such a unique means for our popularity. An artist can't neglect that. Meanwhile, the Rest of the entries in Polenov's album of a Russian volunteer tended to follow the same plan as his Serbian horsemen. Polenov favored pastoral settings where soldiers bivouac on a campaign, along with sweeping panoramic shots that situate the commandeer headquarters, fortifications, and the army's makeshift chapels in the rugged and exotic Balkan foothills. Yet I'd like to engage one entry from Polenov's album of a Russian volunteer in particular. It is a pair of pictures that is both responsive to these overarching landscape concerns that I have just sampled while being completely divergent from their usual sedate mode of presentation. The name Polenov gives these engravings is the grimmest of humor. Polenov takes for his caption the title of Ivan Turgenev's landmark 1862 novel, Atsi Idiot to Your Fathers and Children, used in Russia is a shorthand for the generation gap between gradualist reformist fathers and young radical Russian nihilists. Polenov does not at all intend the phrase's use here as a comment on Sardom's domestic political environment. Polenov divorces the phrase from its original usage to describe a literally foreign context in Bulgaria. Polenov is here engaging explicitly with what were known in the discourse of his day as the Bulgarian horrors. Accounts of Ottoman irregular cavalry indiscriminately raising rebellious Bulgarian villages first surfaced in the London Daily News on June 23rd, 1876. The dispatch of the journalist Janarius McGahan out of the town of Batak later that August elevated these reprisals to a global cause célèbre. Plano's dark joke is thus very simple. The fathers are the Bulgarian smallholders spit upon the borders of their property line and the children are those orphaned by this despicable act. The accuracy of these stories notwithstanding, the Bulgarian horrors became an international topic of discussion. They were mobilized for a variety of diverse purposes, such as a campaign plank in the re-election bid of the eminent British politician, William Gladstone, and somewhat closer to Russia as an anecdote in Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamesov. Dostoevsky used a scene fictionalized from accounts of the horrors as the example that convinces protagonist Ivan Karamezov that if the devil doesn't exist in reality, man would have to create him in his own image and likeness. As in the case of Polenov's wood engraving, 
Dostoevsky incises a similarly graphic picture of infanticide on his reader's mind. By the way, goes the passage in question. A Bulgarian I met lately in Moscow told me all about the crimes committed by Turks and Circassians in all parts of Bulgaria through a fear of a general rising of the Slavs. Imagine a trembling mother with her baby in her arms, a circle of invading Turks around her. They pet the baby, laugh to make it laugh. They succeed, the baby laughs. At that moment, a Turk points a pistol four inches from the baby's face. The baby laughs with glee, holds its little hands to the pistol, and he pulls the trigger in the baby's face and blows out its brains. Artistic, wasn't it? Dostoevsky's quote here is not interesting to me for its subject matter alone, however. The protagonists of Polino's print are clearly much older than the book's ill-fated infant. Now, what interests me is the commingling of aesthetics and brutality that Dostoevsky indexes in his fictional account. The murder is, after all, beautifully done. Artistic, wasn't it? That's Dostoevsky's interlocutor. It is this commingling of pain and the picturesque that draws me now to the left-hand side of Polino's fathers and children. Though quite grisly on its own, this picture of decapitated Bulgarian men and women is in fact a more nuanced form of critical denunciation than the sad stares of the two young girls and its accompanying companion print. Polino's Bulgarian fathers ironically deploys many of the same tropes as appear in Polino's more appealing scenes of Russian country life for social and political objectives. In his left-hand pain of Bulgarian fathers and children, we see how Polenov wickedly perverts a stock trope of pastoral painting, the overgrown wattle barrier reclaimed by and returning to nature, its wooden stakes sprouting back into trees. I have given as quick examples images from the English landscape painters Thomas Gainborough and John Constable, where the barrier in question appears respectively at lower left and lower right. Spiked with the heads of Bulgarian fathers, this innocuous article of agrarian mise-en-scene has here become a kind of macabre cheval de frise, that is a specific kind of field emplacement of interleaved sharpened poles aimed at area denial and designed to impale horses and their riders like Polenov's Serbian cavalry, for instance. Polenov is working in the same tradition of ghastly graphic arts as the early modern printmaker Jacques Callot or the Napoleonic era artist Francisco Goya. Callot, for instance, turned to etching to document the excesses of the Thirty Years' War in Europe, one of the first total wars that made civilian populations the target of premeditated actions. Goya similarly felt the graphic arts could encapsulate the ruthless counterinsurgency waged by French forces against the inhabitants of the Spanish peninsula between 1807 and 1814. The serial nature of Polenov's album of a Russian volunteer is very much like the portfolio of prints about the horrors of war that either of these historical engravers published. Furthermore, for each of these two historical artists, linking the arbor to the atrocity acted as a highly expressive gesture in itself. It helped to restore the bestiality of warfare to the natural realm, to the brutish state of anarchy where life is short and poor. If you look closely at the prints I've sampled so far from Polenov's album, you'll see that he has signed his name in their bottom corners with a fanciful monograph that intertwines his Cyrillic initials. Polenov is very consciously here positioning himself in a tradition of fine art printmaking. Despite the fact that his works were destined for Prahov's mass circulation periodical Chela, he did not think any less of his project, the album of a Russian volunteer. Polino's monogram is not all that different, say, from the iconic AD logotype of the famous 15th century printmaker Albert Durer, enlarged here on the screen at the bottom. Additionally, the scholar Galina Mardilovich has convincingly demonstrated how etching and aquatint were both key parts in the practice of other great Russian artists at the moment, such as the venerable landscapist Ivan Shishkin. I've thrown up one of Shishkin's landscape etchings on the screen at right. 
We know that Polenov had considerable occasion to practice printmaking during his state-funded study trip to Paris in the mid-1870s under the tutelage of wanderer and academy professor Alexei Bogolubov. I want to emphasize here that Polenov's engagement of the tropes and conventions of fine art printmaking are very deliberate given the relatively low status of the work he was doing for the illustrated weekly journal Chela. Polenov, in his role as special artist correspondent, was fortunate enough to occupy the apex of a great pyramid of periodical labor. A small army of contract engravers diligently worked with Buren and magnifying glass to translate Polenov's holograph sketches in paper and pen onto boxwood slabs, suitable for mechanical reproduction. This generally unglamorous, anonymous and poorly remunerated work of wood engraving was fundamentally different from the bespoke wood carving and carpentry for which Polenov would later become famous as an exponent of the Slavic crafts revival on Sava Mamontov's Brahmsava estate. I include as an example one of Polenov's many plans for luxury articles of furniture he devised at the estate on the screen here at center. But I want to look even more closely at Polenov's Bulgarian fathers. There's, I think, another relevant early modern reference alongside artists like Jacques Callot or Durer, that is, the art of the Sotobosca or the understory. The painting by Otto Marcius van Schreik on the right evinces a morbid interest in the slimy, slithery creatures that lurk in the dark of the forest's lowest level. The thicket in Polenov's print shares some of this same unsavory Sotobosco aspect, its preoccupation with decay and decomposition. Polenov's foreground is wildly overgrown with rank weeds, as if the blood of Bulgarian martyrs has watered the ditches of their fields. A murderous harvest bubbles up from the base of Polenov's picture, seedy and naughty and foul. One other similarity between these two pictures is the deployment of the blasted thorn or denuded tree trunk. However, Ventrike positions his rotting log at dead center as an object of analysis. Polenov placed his craggy stump at the extreme right edge of his print. Polenov's thorn here functions as a repoussoir or a side screen that brackets his composition along a margin. This is a classic trope in the centuries old formula of pastoral landscape painting and yet another way the murder Polenov depicts is artistically done. The substitution of a more lush and lively framing tree by the unsightly blasted thorn of the Sotobosco was a relatively recent romantic addition made to the genre of landscape painting in the 1800s. I've given as an example of this modest innovation of a Thorn is Repoussoir from the Anglo-American painter Tom Cole on the screen at right. Cole's thorn on the right edge of his picture works together with the rock waterfall at its left to channel the viewer's gaze into several stacked passages of mountains. These in turn are alternately brightly lit and deeply shadowed, and they hand off the eye between one and the other in a sinuous S-curve, fulfilling another standard formula of landscape art. Now this directed motion creates a fantasy of access as the gaze stretches out towards the tantalizing break in the storm clouds on the horizon. Polenov, by contrast, denies us this distance. This is in keeping with the atrocitarian themes of his print. Polenov's composition is as truncated and as aborted as the severed heads that top this gnarly fence. We are made to be as still and as immobile as the dead. We are stuck there, front and center, like a lump on a log with no forward motion any longer possible. My attempts to reveal how Polenov depicts murder artistically, using all these references to a variety of aesthetic traditions, are all meant to bring us full circle to the landscape paintings Polenov will eventually create in the late 1870s and early 1880s after his return from war. I have put Polenov's overgrown pond of 1879 up on the screen to indicate how the consumption of ramshackle wooden structures by tangles of unruly understory foliage is a trope common elsewhere in his oeuvre, as we might expect of a landscape painter. 
we see the same tangled repoussoir erupt from the left side of Moscow courtyard as well. This shrubbery screen helps to lead the eye in towards the beaten dirt path at center and into the picture's open middle distance. Moscow courtyard has a much more unrestricted and capacious middle and background than the foreclosed father's print. The repoussoir framing in Moscow courtyard has a very special narrative function though, one that is quite salient given Polino's theme back in 1877 of Bulgarian fathers and children. The middle distance that Polinov steers his beholder towards is populated with unattended toddlers playing amongst themselves. This is a qualitatively different lack of supervision than the one implied in Polinov's excoriating graphic art just a year earlier. Furthermore, Polinov secrets in the very depths of Moscow courtyard a precious image of a kerchief mother with her arm wrapped lovingly around her daughter's shoulder. In this embrace, she shows the child how to broadcast feed to the chickens pecking on the ground to their right, passing along the rudiments of animal husbandry. This intergenerational ideal is part of the pastoral idol that Polenov so charismatically goes on to paint. Polenov's 1878 canvas, Grandmother's Garden, on the screen now at right, is very much like a sequel to the mother-daughter scene we saw in Moscow Courtyard. It depicts a young lady lending her arm to her relative as they take a stroll in the luxuriant heat of a close Russian summer. Bulgarian Fathers and Children is the diametrical opposite of what Polenov goes on to paint in his more mainstream landscape art. The middle-aged parents of the two Bulgarian girls in Polenov's print will not enjoy growing old like the titular Russian babushka and grandmother's garden. The Bulgarian parents were instead cut down in their prime, dead long before their seniority. Polenov denies their children the same intensely tactile linkages of a wrist slipped companionably through an elbow or an enfolding hug, gestures seen elsewhere in his Russian works. The two Bulgarian children have to instead huddle against each other and wring their own hands for warmth. While the grown Russian woman in Polenov's painting extends a helping hand to her elder, it is these youth who require assistance of a philanthropic sort in Bulgaria, made old before their time. I thus begin to show you how Polenov can variably use the same techniques of landscape painting to both condemn an alleged war crime and create appealing scenes drawn from Russian rural experience. However, my argument so far has been somewhat circumstantial. I now seek to link these two problems together, the status of life as a non-combatant in the embattled Balkans and the project to create a national landscape aesthetic begun in part at Abramsovo. The linchpin here that unites these separate sets of objects is Polenov's engagement with Balkan cottage design, an interest first noted in my introduction as letters from Polenov's colleague Ilya Repin. These many sketches were the material for Polenov's paintings of the huts and quarters where the Russian army stood idle. Polenov drew these handsome tile-roofed dwellings as conspicuously empty of life. He shows them in the dead of winter with the flanking deciduous trees stripped of their leaf cover. Polenov also shows them in something of an intermediate state. The occupants of these homes have clearly already abandoned them, they likely fled the possibility of becoming caught up in further violent reprisals like the Bulgarian horrors. Yet the Russian army's logisticians have yet to move in and appropriate these buildings for the purposes of war. Now the cottage door historically was a powerful topos. In England, for example, during the last decades of the 18th century, Polenov's chosen setting staged social and political complaints about the enclosure of ancient commons, the industrialization of agriculture, and job displacement and poverty in the country. I've used as an example one of Thomas Gainsborough's entries on the theme. Gainsborough here carefully cloaks the overcrowding and the child labor that afflicted this idyllic locale in the softened and browned forms of picturesque painting. Repin, in a way, 
has been a very salient interlocutor for this talk in his role as Poleno's erstwhile correspondent. When Repin exhibited his apocal barge haulers on the Volga in 1873, he seemed to confirm an expectation that tendentious pictures in Russia, engaged with the serious problems of their day, must always be accompanied by the outward form and iconography of oppression. It is thus that rustic Russian painting, as it were, and the historiography of Russian landscape never quite experienced the same sharp turn towards social history that British pastoral art enjoyed, for instance, in the 1980s. John Constable's scenes of bargemen on the river store, pictured here on the screen at left, came to subtly signify the intrinsically human disruptions of capitalism in England. Meanwhile, Repin's picture of Berlaki na Volge, on the contrary, remains rooted in Russia's timeless feudal past and is often read as a sign of the empire's backwardness. This turn is an interpretive tradition that I believe can begin to explain Poleno's preoccupation with the cottage. Because in addition to his cottages, Polenov made numerous drawings of the prosperous Balkan civilians absent from his sketches of their homesteads. These people are wealthy enough to turn out in national costume to welcome their Russian liberators, but are shown physically displaced from their habitations. They are scattered across the pages of Polenov's sketchbooks. Polenov also sketched the shadows, the cattle and the horses that made these Ottoman subject peoples so wealthy and healthy. Now, as regards the prosperity of these figures, Polenov saw nothing out of the ordinary here. The Slav peoples were, as a rule, materially better off than the Russians who rushed in to rescue them. This discrepancy provoked dissonance among the volunteers and the regular infantry who participated in the Eastern crisis. Fyodor Dostoevsky is once again eloquent regarding this aspect of the war. In November 1877, in his serialized column, The Diary of a Writer, Dostoevsky describes how we considered that when we entered Bulgaria, we would have to feed not only our own army, but also the starving Bulgarians. Suddenly, we saw the charming little Bulgarian houses surrounded by delightful gardens, flowers, fruits, cattle, cultivated land, yielding almost a hundredfold, and to top it all, three Orthodox churches for every mosque. This among people oppressed for their faith. The writer and prominent populist Glebo Spiansky described much the same scene in Serbia. Contentment is noticeable everywhere, wrote Uspiansky. Nowhere in Russia or anywhere abroad did I see such spaciousness and comfort. Everywhere, the sprawling white stone homes built spaciously, cheerful looking in the greenery of its gardens, everywhere, this large storage sheds. It seems that the Serbs are very rich, too fleshy and well-fed. These quotes should immediately throw up red flags concerning Polenov's depictions of the Bulgarian hut. In short, Polenov's huts are incongruously tumble down. He paints these structures not as they were described, but as Russia's observers in the Balkans would have first liked to have seen them. Russia's alleged embarrassment before the Balkan peoples had very palpable material coordinates. To borrow Dostoevsky's list, gardens, flowers, fruits, cattle, these were all the very stuff of landscape paintings. Some of these details, like cows, for instance, made Polenov sketches, but they are all absent from Polenov's finished pictures. This omission, in a word, is the very definition of the picturesque, as it was first advanced by the English cleric William Gilpin in the mid 18th century. In his cottage sketches, Polenov activates two principles that Gilpin would have recognized as continuous with his recommendations. The first of these is illustrated by the two prints I've put up on the screen from Gilpin's drawing manuals on the subject. The polite landscape sketcher to Gilpin's mind is expected to disrupt and modulate clean and regular forms. Roughness was the watchword of the picturesque. A landscape ought to be varied, broken, or intricate. Where drawing practice intersected the built environment, that meant adding in a pleasing decrepitude to otherwise well-kept structures, like the tidy Balkan homestead, as described by Dostoevsky or Spiansky. 
The second principle is an extension of this slightly dishonest artistic fudging, if you will, the beheld vista. The picturesque sketcher could choose to ignore unsightly or confounding details they found inconvenient to their aesthetic or ideological objectives. This often meant editing out scenes of crude agricultural labor or the peasant body altogether. The picturesque in both regards helped the connoisseurs of landscape see what they wanted to see. Now to see this process in action, compare the sketch that most closely resembles Poleno's painting of a Bulgarian hut to the canvas proper. A brief inventory of his art's contents shows how Polenov went to great pains to degrade what he already registered as a pretty Spartan accommodation. Polenov, for instance, dismantled the covered wagon at the right of his sketch into its constituent parts when he transferred its design to the easel. In the painting, a lone remnant wheel stands propped against one of the two sawn down trees that raise a sheaf of switches off the ground. Similarly, the huge white sheet flapping in the wind of the sketch becomes a series of tattered and bedraggled nightgowns draped over the painting's laundry line. Additionally, in the painting, the roof of the house is no longer flush with its wall. Polenov has drastically exaggerated the slight crook he first noticed at the roof's midpoint. It is thus that the roof on the canvas slumps raggedly downwards towards the right. It must be propped up to forestall a total collapse. What's more, there are no delightful gardens, flowers, or fruits anywhere in Poleno's sketchbooks or his Balkan series. In an act of transference, almost all the qualities that Gleb Uspensky imputes to Serbian homes, prosperity, spaciousness, and comfort, whitestone construction, greenery, tenderness, softness, effeminacy, all are truer of pictures such as Moscow Courtyard, and grandmother's garden than Polenov's Bulgarian hut. By contrast, the tawny tones that Polenov settles on for his Balkan paintings evince an especially arid ambience. The picturesque that lends a kind of winsome indolence to Moscow courtyard or grandmother's garden is willfully used instead to revise Russian impressions of affluent Ottoman subject peoples. In light of these quotations, from Pan-Slavist pundits like Dostoevsky and Uspensky, we finally recognize the stakes of Polenov's project to paint Russian landscape in the immediate few years following his demobilization. And it is thus that I return to Abramsova, like Polenov first did on that morning in January 1878, to end my talk today. Over the past decade, scholars such as Rosalind Blakesley and Wendy Salmon have done much to demonstrate the affinities between the Slavic revival perpetuated at Abramsova and the arts and crafts movement in Britain. I merely add to their observations one point made by the art historian Tim Berenger. Berenger notes that the British arts and crafts movement first emerged through the perceived inferiority of the British colonial center to its periphery. Britons were concerned that homegrown English manufacturers were diminishing in quality compared to the artisanal goods exported from India. England's analogous Gothic revival attempted to reassert the colonizer's aesthetic hegemony by making more beautiful objects. Now, while Russia never colonized the Balkans per se, it is still true that Dostoevsky, Uspensky, and maybe Polenov too, were all expressing in a like sense of inferiority across these accounts, both verbal and visual, of Russia's imperial adventures in this crucial contact zone. The assertion of the hegemon's aesthetic superiority over the course of my talk has merely taken place in landscape art rather than the province of material culture. From this frame of reference, I offer in conclusion that Polenov's participation in the Slavic revival at Abramsova and his work towards a national landscape aesthetic was merely the continuation of his wartime experiences in the Balkans by other means. It was a seamless extension forward into time of his prior engagement with the same Slavophile discourses, which equally informed Dostoevsky's diaries, as well as the more alarmish reportage 
about the Bulgarian horrors. And so with that, I turn the microphone back over to the organizers of 19V and Lucian. I thank you all very much for your attention and uh, I look forward to the comments and, and questions and remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Wonderful to hear your work. Um, now I, we will turn the microphone over to Lucien and um, for our, our Sebisednik remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen and the organizers uh, for inviting me. Uh, why don't we start off with the obvious, uh, what a, a rich and sophisticated presentation, um, which no doubt reflects a, a truly great dissertation. We look forward to seeing it. Uh, you touch upon art history, uh, Bulgarian and Imperial Russian history, uh, issues regarding uh, media and society, uh, as well as European influences and in foreign policy. So there is quite a bit to comment here. And as a historian of Imperial Russia and the Balkans, I just wanna share some observations. Uh, first, uh, I'm really glad to learn more about Polenov because uh, Vera Shagan and the other wanderers seem to get uh, much more press uh, uh, than this great artist. Um, and uh, it was fascinating to note his father's experience. And I don't know, Stephen, if this will work in what you're dealing with, uh, but he's a, a really influential historian who follows uh, liberal themes. He actually spends uh, his early career in the Balkans. He's stationed uh, in Greece in the 1830s. Uh, so now, no doubt, Vasily grows up with a lot of books about the Balkans at home. Uh, and this provides for this liberal educated upbringing, which is eventually uh, part of his canvases. Uh, my second uh, point uh, regards the diversity of Panslavism, um, a, a word which you uh, eschew uh, using at least until the final sentences of this report. Uh, and uh, what I mean to say is that uh, based upon Polenov's background and overall look on life, uh, Panslavism is not merely the terrain uh, for uh, right-wing uh, conservative intellectuals like Katkov or Pobedidnostsev. Uh, and indeed, there's a liberal strain uh, in uh, the overall movement uh, for Slavic unity. Uh, and again, that's reflected in his paintings. And I'm not quite sure if he's intentionally uh, making these Bulgarian scenes uh, look, uh, look somehow run down or rudimentary. I mean, you can travel through Bulgaria today and see very much of the same sort of village uh, setting. Uh, so it's interesting, these sketches are what you think are, are uh, the basis for arguing that he tries to um, make the situation more crude uh, than he actually witnesses. Uh, my, my third point uh, says something maybe about foreign policy. Uh, uh, public opinion is now playing a role in the Tsar's decision. Uh, and in 1878, it's a big headache for the foreign ministry. They want nothing to do with Balkan affairs. Uh, but as canvases like this begin to enter uh, the, the body of politic, you know, people reading Pichela, uh, they are no doubt intrigued, sympathetic. Uh, and, it, and it works with overall this movement of society, which is then a part of the novels that you're talking about. Uh, to get involved and it placed pressures uh, on the Tsar to eventually intervene, even though he may not uh, wish to at first. Uh, another point, my fourth point, um, has to do with an alternative to Western models, uh, which of course artists and intellectuals and, and writers in, in Russia are, are learning from. And here we've got these idealized uh, Bulgarians, uh, these uh, Slavs who are now, uh, you know, the, the elite, the, the readers of Chela, the people who have the money and the literacy to appreciate these paintings are now uh, inspired further to think more broadly about Russia's uh, interaction with the greater um, Slavic world. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, something about uh, the serf uh, emancipation, I think, fits in here because uh, we're getting a, a broader reading public by the 1880s, 1870s, uh, and how are they reflecting about um, these people being liberated uh, from foreign rule or from oppression, these Bulgarian Slavs uh, who now have their independence. And no doubt this uh, strikes real close to home uh, for many uh, recently literate uh, peasant um, who is now getting a copy of these magazines and reflecting about, uh, again, the broader world. So uh, my final comment, you know, really great, great presentation. And uh, I would like to, uh, conclude with, with an observation that really not since the Reformation uh, has religion played such a role in politics and in foreign policy as the Balkan revolts of the 1870s. Uh, and we've got artists here uh, of great ability, uh, of uh, you know, permanent uh, contributions, uh, really 
um, being part of this overall discussion about uh, the fate of these people uh, in the Balkans. Uh, so thanks again, Stephen, and the rest of you uh, for, uh, uh, for joining us today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your comments, Lucien. And um, we will um, invite Stephen to respond while everyone else has a little chance to think about questions they might pose. And uh, Sasha will, will then moderate our discussion. Yeah, I mean, so while we wait for everybody, I mean, thank you, Lucien, for bringing up all of these points. I mean, the part that I, I'm really excited about is like Dmitry Polanov, right? Um, because he actually gets a telegraph um, from Pyotr Izeyev, the rector of the Imperial Academy of Arts, to start nagging his son to actually like reply to the Romanov family and agree to work on this painting cycle that they're requesting of him. And, you know, Polanov at this moment is you know, bulkened out at the start, right? Like he's already done, you know, work for the journal in the region, but he's sort of in conversations around the same time with the critic Vladimir Stasov, who is like, hey, Polenov, you need to do something more original. You're too much like Repin. You don't need to stay in Moscow like Repin is doing. You don't need the city. You have to find your sort of own voice at this moment. And it is sort of telling then, you know, that Polenov listens to his father and goes off and, and produces the cycle of painting. Um, but let me stop there, because I think um, some questions have popped up in the chat. Um, do you, does the, the organizing committee want to field those or? Yeah, uh, I'll do that. So uh, our first question that we got um, is, uh, did your research involve field work? No, this is the state of the COVID pandemic, right? I am both embarrassed and somewhat, I, I guess, like strangely proud to say this, but I have been relying extensively on digitized sources for this. Um, so gaskatalog.ru has been an enormous resource for finding sketchbooks, for finding studies. And in some of you know, the, the most remote museums that I don't think I would have been able to visit you know, on say like a Yale Macmillan Center funded you know, study trip over a summer, it would just be too far. And instead I'm able to sort of you know, bring these objects into the discussion. I think there are obvious questions about like, A, you know, how much can I say based on things like facture on color that is entirely dependent on the quality of the reproduction and photograph, but also B, like there will be work in the future to sort of authenticate these works and make sure that, you know, they're not wrongly cataloged or the signature is smudged or something like that. Um, you know, and, and then there is sort of a huge trove of 19th century periodicals that are available online, and that's determined the scope of the project to a certain extent. Um, you know, I, I want to thank the folks at the Slavic and Eastern European collection at NYC, because at the, you know, thick of the pandemic, they were able to give me, you know, that image of, you know, Bulgarian fathers and children when, you know, the PDFs, you know, only have, you know, issues 14, 15, 16 for the magazine. I uh, uh, unmuted. You can hear me? Yes. Thumbs up. Good. Stephen, thanks very much for the paper. Um, I do uh, uh, Russian 19th and 20th century history here at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm interested in the Balkan Wars because I'm interested in the Russian occupation regime there under uh, uh, Cherkasky. Um, stupendous presentation in the dimensions that Lucien has, has identified and following on after Lucien. I'm, I'm a historian, so these are our thoughts, observations that come really from the field of history. The, the first point is in addition to Lucien's point about the emancipation and the emergence of a new readership, one of the um, interesting features about this war is it's also the first war in which the Russian army is a mass conscript army and not professional serving serf soldiers. Um, and this relates to, to a second point. In a sense, it's, it's that made it, many of the people doing images of that war focus on the Russian soldiers precisely because it for the first time was in a sense a Russian national army. And it's the absence of those images of Russian soldiers and in fact combat that I find uh, somewhat striking. So is that simply a, a, a choice of focus in your work or, or is that actually an absence? Um, a, a, a second question is, uh, we can well imagine that this is a, a Slavic war and is popular, but of course, in terms of its military conduct, it's actually very bungled and it becomes a point of great criticism in Russian society, both that the government didn't want to get into the war and then when it gets into the war, it wages it badly. And it's, of course, the members of the royal family that are doing this, this becomes known as the Grand Duke's War. And um, so it's, it's interesting that Palyanov is in fact commissioned 
by the Ramat Burhana family. And I'm wondering whether there's any tension there. This would speak to Lucien's point, um, but between um, wanting to portray the everyday soldiers, the common soldiers, the Bulgarian peasants, um, either as a critique or a way not to discuss and avoid discussing the incompetence of the uh, 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 royal family. And I'll shut up, but it's a stupendous presentation. Yeah, I mean, th thank you for these great comments, right? I, I guess I'll just take them in the order that they were given, right? Um, so this question about, you know, Polenov not painting the Russian soldier, right? It's like, Repin paints a conscript returning home from war. And I thought about starting this presentation instead of like mm -hmm. using uh, Polenov's like sketches on the one side of the screen to use Repin's picture of, you know, a Russian infantryman with like a knapsack over his bag, you know, walking through the snowy mm -hmm. scenery, you know, back mm -hmm. homewards. and. I'll, I'll just sort of loop back to, you know, the quote that Repin had in his letter to Ivan Kravskoy, right? You know, he's, he's saying, you know, Polenov isn't painting, you know, the, the how he's only painting the houses, he's not painting the guns, there are no battles. And then he quotes, you know, probably not accurately, but he quotes Polenov, you know, it's like, the Russian army is not picturesque, but the Turkish ones, another matter. And like, I think there may have been something, you know, like underwhelming about the presentation of the Russian soldier, given the fact that they are sort of, you know, an incredibly organized, mechanized army that is also falling apart at the pieces, right? It's like all of these, you know, uh, there, there's no variation, you know, that the picturesque would demand for in something that's so regimented, where, you know, maybe the Serbians, because they're in a regular fighting force, or maybe the Bulgarians, because they're partisans, or maybe the Turks, because they have the Circassians, offers more variety that is stimulating to the painter. Um, so that might be one reason for sort of the absence of it. I mean, this isn't a problem for like Konstantin Savitsky, right? Who like paints the Russian conscript in all his glory in his 1880 and 1888 uh, to war, right? So it's it's gotta be a temperament issue with the two artists. Um, to get to your second point, right? Yeah, it's like, is there tension, you know, working for the Romanovs and witnessing this war fall to pieces, right? It's like, they can't keep up with the train timetables. The siege of Plevna goes on for too long. It's, and he's there at the siege of Plevna. He sees people, you know, the casualties evacuated from, I think, the third, you know, battle to try and break the siege. And, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the painting, right, of, let me see if I can get back up on the screen here for you guys. I'll go back to the painting of um, the Bulgarian hut, the, the sort of full finished painting of the Bulgarian hut that I introduced at the beginning. Okay, right. So this is to get at the question of like tension. You know, it's like Polenov probably, Polenov is aware of like all of the drama going around Vasily Vereshagin's, you know, series. He saw what happened during the war in Central Asia when Vereshagin did, you know, a, a sort of, you know, grisly series of canvases and Alexander II said, you know, in my army, such incidents cannot happen. And Polenov doesn't want to ruin his reputation. His father, right, you know, Dmitry Polenov, doesn't want him to ruin his reputation. And so there has to be, if he's going to say anything about the poor conduct of the war or the humanitarian crisis that it touches off, he has to do it perhaps asophically. And I mean, one thing that I didn't mention is like you have this ambiguous set of figures here over to the left, like someone who is probably a Circassian with like the powder tools, the, the garb, the hat, et cetera, you know, accompanying sort of an anonymous artist figure over to the side. And like, if this painting is meant to sit in like the Grand Duke's dining room, I think it's a very sort of provocative gesture to potentially have, you know, one of the members of the opposing force just kind of like peeking over the shoulder of the European and addressing the beholder directly. I mean, similarly, the Bulgarians are sort of addressing the beholder directly and you've got this dual address here. And like that, you know, like that tension, right? You know, that desire to be honest to the truth of the war may reside in those two features, if that sort of gets at your remark. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Alison Hilton. Uh, Lucien's point about how the liberation of serfs not long ago influenced how the great liberation of Balkan people from Turkey suggests some imaginary, some imagery in painting by Repin leave taking of recruits, Kromskoy, Savitsky, and others. A slightly tangential question. What about photographs of soldiers and locations? Thanks. Mm, I haven't considered photographs, right? I mean, because I think, I think one of the complaints of the Russian realists at this time is they're like, realism, you know, is more real than the photographs, right? And I mean, I'm sort of drawing on like the Americanists who are talking about the uh, weakness of the photograph, right? It's like the photograph can only show you something indexically that's happened before the camera, right? 
you can't sort of do, you know, it's like, you know, a, you can't stage like a tearful mother, you know, like embracing his son as he's about to get on the wagon to go off to the war. The exposure times would be too long, right? Um, and so, you know, if I'm not really focusing on photographs, it's because I think like, like for instance, in, in Peter's question, right? Like if you're going to kind of like subtly, asophically, you know, address the conflict of the war, you may want to do that in, you know, illusionistic easel painting based off of the Imperial Academy of Arts curriculum, where you kind of have like more latitude to work your, your message or your critical denunciation into it. Um, you know, I mean, the reason why like wood engravings are, you know, still, it's like 1878, you know, history of early photography is going strong. We still have wood engravings in Shola because like you can tell more stories with them. And the photograph itself is kind of like resisting, you know, uh, narrative, it's resisting exegesis. And you always have to caption it in order to bring out those concerns and make it do what you want it to as an authorial figure. Um, does that kind of get at your remark? Very quickly, I think um, all of you discussed the first part of my question fairly thoroughly, so I'll leave that. But I do suggest looking at the photographs. I've mainly looked at some from a little bit later in the Balkan Wars uh, ongoing series, but there are some from the 70s. They're not really staged, but they're groups of soldiers mostly sitting around. And I think some of the places uh, which were quite picturesque with all those mountains um, were photographed as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a really great part of early photography. You know, it's like, I yeah. think Greppen in 73 is exhibiting, you know, Burla Key as, you know, um, like Edward Moybridge is putting up his mammoth plates, right? And so, yeah, it, it would be great to look at history of photography and, and landscape in particular. Well, there, were, there were postcards yeah. Um, on photographs, popular, mm -hmm. fits in with your popular imagery thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the movement yeah. from medium to medium. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. I'm very impressed with your work done within those pandemic constraints. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, go back actually to Alison's question about photographs because I happen to work with the um, fonds of Alexander III in Garf. And uh, as you know, he was, of course, at, at this war and he was uh, close to uh, Palenov. Uh, and uh, one of the documents uh, that when the borders are open, you will be able to have a look at is the album of the photographs taken at the uh, at at the uh, during the this uh, campaign um, 1877 and I can later send you a link and as far as I remember because I looked at them many years ago so they are the views of those local sceneries uh, which actually resemble the one of the uh, title uh, pictures that you present uh, here. And uh, uh, another question actually um, uh, also is related to what Peter um, asked about the sort of agency of the Grand Dukes and the, the Romanovs in this representation of this campaign uh, to the public. Um, and in the Tetikov gallery, there is uh, this a letter from Bogolubov to um, Palenov. I think it wasn't published. So where uh, Bogolubov uh, tells that uh, he was actually the one who suggested Palenov as the one to be sent uh, and uh, to uh, to follow the um, the heir, and he was uh, kind of teaching him how to please uh, the the heir. And uh, one of the things which he suggested, as far as I remember, was that uh, Alexander Alexandrovich is very fond of things realistic. Uh, he's not into those, you know, um, uh, picturesque uh, things and so on and so forth. So I think this is also uh, in, uh, could be an interesting source, but maybe you've already uh, uh, covered this. And uh, I, I think uh, also that it's very interesting how your research expands the um, 
the mm, repertoire of the different reactions of different artists towards one particular event. So we have Vrepin with his very picturesque um, sketch for the uh, painting, uh, the return from of the soldiers to the war, and he frames his task as a really picturesque one, and he then decides not to paint the big painting because uh, he then saw uh, Kramskoy's painting and he understood that his project fails, that Kramskoy is so uh, better than, uh, than uh, he is. And uh, uh, also, I think uh, it's interesting how at the same time, this um, Palenov's uh, uh, image, the interior of the um, one of the huts where Alexander Alexandrovich uh, Gwenduk is sitting at his table, which is a very cozy space uh, in contrast to those uh, exteriors of the, the very same probably huts which are uh, depicted in, in other paintings. So um, yeah, so thank you so much for, for, for the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, thank you one for turning me on to like these sources, right? Because I think one of the greatest difficulties is like, I think I'm using like, yeah, Elena, you know, like Sahadova's, you know, collected letters of Poleno, like I'm rating bibliographies of different catalogs in order to track down these various sources, but like Bogolubov's, you know, letter to Poleno. I mean, this, I mean, for one, like this is what Bogolubov does. Everybody likes him, right? <laughs> He's like constantly connecting people. He gets like Kramskoy commissions to work on churches. He, you know, like all of, all of the artists pass through him and he, and he sort of like loves that position, right? Of like being the grandmaster in Paris, you know, like the special consul or attache to the academy. And, you know, like Bogolubov appears in another one of the chapters that I'm writing in this dissertation. And so just like, having that communication to provide like such a nice through line while also explaining like some of the reason why, you know, like he painted what he did. I also love the suggestion of these photographs because like, you know, the idea that like, if these photographs look like Polino's paintings, this is just ringing alarm bells of like ethnography, anthropology, like the human sciences developing in this moment in relationship to photographs, which is like a very rich topos, I think. Um, and, you know, your last comment about the interior of the hut where like Alexander is sitting in his camp chair or whatever, I mean, that may be what Repin is like referring to when he says like the interior of their huts, like he saw a sketch for that or something like that. And just like, yeah, having that would be awesome. And we have a question from Louise Hardman. Um, she had to leave for another event, but wanted to add this question and comments. Uh, so first, thank you, Stephen, for highlighting the less known parts of Palenov's work. This has given useful hinterland for works such as the burnt forest, which has always seemed something of an outlier. And now a question, is it possible that Palenov envy Vidishagin's overseas success in the early 1870s and was playing with some of the approaches, for example, uh, Vivi's 1872 canvas triumph they celebrate also has the heads on spikes? I think if he was experimenting with it, like doing it in like Krakow's periodical would be a very safe space to experiment it, right? Because like, when I look at like, I think like Elena Polenova in one of her letters, if I'm remembering correctly, you know, is, is commenting about her brother's state of mind after finishing this cycle for the Romanov commissions. And she's like, oh, thank God he's done with it. You know, he was worried that he was never gonna get rid of them. And now he doesn't have to worry about kind of like, you know, setting off the Romanos by painting something scandalous like Vereshagin. And I think like, I could see Polenov being conflicted here, right? It's like on the one hand, you know, say like in like 77, he's like full of like youthful insouciance, wants to try his hand at being denunciatory and critical. And then, you know, he gets a letter from Bogolubov. Bogolubov is telling him to be more professional. His father is telling him to take this commission because it's good for his career. And, you know, that goes out of the window. No more acting like Vereshagin because like the memory of like, um, like Dmitry Milutin and Alexander II just like, you know, pouring down on Vereshagin for the Central Asia canvases is I think probably very fresh in, in everybody's mind. Um, and Vereshagin is like to the end of his day struggling to make ends meet. So he's not a very good role model when it comes to, you know, pitching the tenor of your canvas to the person who's supposed to buy it. Thank you very much, Stephen, for a fascinating talk. 
um, obviously, the Vidishagan, Vidishagan did do very brutal paintings of this war as well. So he doesn't stop doing that. And he also participated in the war and was wounded, as a matter of fact. So uh, I think you really do need to, I mean, it, it is a very different, uh, I don't know who's whispering in Vidishagan's ear, but uh, obviously his, his parents, like I'm telling my kids to behave themselves. His parents did not, were not influencing him. But he didn't mention someone else, which is Tolstoy. Because the, the, the Crimean War, of course, is Tolstoy's war. And his, uh, the, the, the three Sevastopol sketches are very painterly. And precisely look at the issue of nature versus war and make the argument that nature, that, that war has, human war has no place in nature. It's hard for me to, and I know that Polyanov, I don't know much about this, but I know that Polyanov did meet Tolstoy and had some interactions with him. So you mentioned Dostoevsky, but I suspect that there's a Tolstoy piece here that you might want to give, give some thought to. Uh, there's, I believe there may be correspondence, there may be, they certainly did meet one another. So I wonder, uh, uh, and, and if he's reading Dostoevsky, he certainly read the Sevastopol sketches. So I'm wondering whether there isn't, isn't something more for your theme here, especially the relationship between the idyllic uh, uh, and the, the warlike, or does he, does he choose the romantic because it in integrates the warlike into the idyllic? It's, it's just an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, thank thank you for these comments, right? And like, I definitely think, yeah, tracking down the Tolstoy connection is is, is sort of a, a good path to take, right? I mean, nature versus war, right? Like, Vedashagin is really eloquent on this because, I mean, I'm in in the chapter that this is excerpted from. Polenov is the first half, Vedashagin is the second half, and like Vedashagin's Brooklyn Museum paintings, right, are of a column of Turkish prisoners sort of processing along a Russian military highway into captivity behind, you know, the front lines of the conflict, right? And, you know, I think one of the things that Vitershagen is kind of in dialogue with when he's conceiving those paintings of the highway of the war prisoners is sort of the egregiousness with which, you know, Russian engineers will carve out a line in the Balkans, you know, through, through down, down the mountains, through the valleys, through the snow drifts, and then kind of just the complete and total irreverence that nature has towards this undertaking. You know, I mean, Vereshagin will write in his diaries about how he watches, you know, the engineers, you know, shovel the pathways clear and the crivets, uh, you know, the hurricane gale force winds just erase, you know, the army's attempt to like literally subjugate the land by drawing these sort of calligraphic lines of the highway over it. And so, you know, bringing this, I, I think, treating Vereshagin not only as like a battalist, as a, as a war painter, but also as like a landscapist is you know, a definitely a way to sort of, you know, bring the blend of concerns together with what you're saying about Vedishagan. Yeah, and go ahead, please. I would also point out, Stephen, that that uh, weather was a big problem in the in the war and uh, upset the plans of the war makers. The, the, the plan was to to uh, to get to a certain point uh, uh, at a certain time, and they didn't succeed in doing that because of the weather. And if you read Garshin's stories, for instance, that comes out just what a very hot, dry summer that was, and how difficult that made the war the war planning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, weather weather is very evocative. I mean, the Brooklyn Museum mm -hmm. paintings are Turnerian. You know, it's like you know Hannibal crossing the Alps is sort of the obvious reference um, for that. But yeah, the plevna delay, the you know the mud complicating, you know carrying caissons and cannon over exactly. the mountain range. Yeah, it's I mean it's it's general winter, even if it's not you know Russia's general winter. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of of the esoteric nature of the paintings that he does somehow manage to redeem himself with some sidelines. Yeah. Yeah, That's not a total point. sellout, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I will um, just jump in and say um, yes. Um, Maria Chukcheva brought up uh, Konstantin Malkovsky's painting, the Bulgarian um, martyrs, and I was wondering if you had, um, uh, I mean, other than Vereshagin, um, were you thinking about um, 
well, two uh, two things, I guess. One is, was he, was, was Polyana participating with this sort of general movement of, you know, uh, depictions of the, um, the situation in a, uh, was he contributing to say the um, uh, fundraisers or exhibitions other apart from the Pshala publications um, in support of this, the, the, the war movement? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, like, I don't know, you know, like, this is one of the most frustratingly circumstantial parts of the argument oh. is that, like, I have not read anything by Polina, but it's like, it's, maybe I, I just need to, like, read his diaries even more closely, but, like, I don't know, you know, if he's attending fundraisers, precisely what his opinion is, and, you know, I'm using the art as much as I can to infer that, mm -hmm. but, you know, it does seem, it, it's nebulous to me, it's, it's a question mark at this point in time. I mean, the um, Makovsky's painting is, is sort of another kettle of fish, right? I mean, it's like it's like Poleno's like Orientalist easel paintings, you know, of you know the the uh, Montenegrin and the Odialisk, right? Um, and it's definitely working in a different register than these sort of you know landscape paintings, which are just you know I think sort of you know open ground to sort of think about how that work done in those you know very sort of straightforward Orientalist looking paintings in terms of you know critique and denunciation can also happen. In something more understated, like the Bulgarian hut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, um, lots to lots lots of uh, different aspects of this facets of this project. It's really wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. I was also wondering if you were um, thinking about you your you, your work on the picturesque and the picturesque theory uh, of landscape that he's working with um, is very compelling. And when I think about Vereshagin's approach to um, to depicting landscape and, and scenery in general, of course, his work is, has a more photographic quality or a, trying to approach that quality. And I was wondering if that's a, an element of contrast that you're bringing in their different approaches, the, the sort of more painterly roughness versus the more uh, photographic smoothness, if that uh, plays into what you're doing at all. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the complicating factor for Vedershagen is that he lost so many of like those sketches that, that Polenov came away with, right? Mm -hmm. Like if Vedershagen, you know, was, you know, doing kind of like the same, you know, like sketching practice, which I think he absolutely was that Polenov was doing, he, you know, those got lost in the mail as he sent them home, I believe, right? And so he had to come back and, you know, was like trying to like quickly reconstitute the landscape. And like, this might be a little bit of like, biographical fallacy, but, you know, if maybe his, the landscapes in his Russo-Turkish war series are like kind of drab and plain and understated, that's because he was, you know, I don't know, working perhaps more quickly to like fill up all of the ideas that he lost when, when he lost those works. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well then, maybe we will, we will wrap up there. So, uh, to conclude, I'll just say thank you so much to Steve and Yurchik for a wonderful presentation and what promises to be an extremely rich dissertation chapter and a dissertation that I think we're all looking forward to reading. And Lucien, thank you so much for your comments. They were really um, helped to broaden out the discussion in, in wonderful ways. So thank you much to both of you.